Got it. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. And as Lisa said, I am a certified cat behaviorist. And I will say that as a cat behaviorist, a question that I'm often asked is, why do you spend so much time helping cats? Why don't you take your energy and your education in, and help people? Why don't you spend your time helping people? But the truth is, when you help cats, you are also always helping people. People tend to assume that if a cat has a behavior problem, that problem must be with the cat. Most of the time, this simply is not true. Most of these cats are not difficult and they really don't have behavior problems at all. The fact is their humans often have problems and this creates problems for the cats. Whenever a human being has a serious problem, such as illness, divorce, job loss, bereavement, a pandemic, you will always find a cat suffering at the other end of it. So you really never help a cat without also helping a person. Now, don't get me wrong. I spend a lot of time helping people whose cats just won't use that litter box. Cats who scratch on everything except for that lovely scratchy post that you brought home. And what to do when you bring home Fluffy as a companion for Puffy. And as it turns out, Puffy didn't want a new brother or sister all that much. But I also help people in distress. For example, just last week, a woman contacted me to say she would have to surrender her cash. And she started off this conversation by telling me she was sure there was nothing that I could possibly do to help. You see, she had cancer and several small children. She was terrified, exhausted, and completely overwhelmed. Amidst all of this, she had an older cash and she was feeling bad, guilty even, because she felt that she couldn't give this cat enough attention. This woman and I talked for a very long time. I listened. I listened to her describe her situation. And eventually I said to her, your children are stressed because you are sick, but they will feel even more stressed if they lose the family cat at the same time. I also reminded her that cats are fundamentally loyal, caring, and incredibly perceptive animals, something I'm sure a lot of you already know. So if her cat didn't get the same amount of attention for a period of time because this woman was getting treated for cancer, well, that cat's part of the family. And that's what families do. And that's okay. I also explained to her that the cat would surely prefer to give up some attention temporarily rather than to lose her family permanently. Sometimes people just need to be reassured. But then the woman was crying. She said to me, do you really think it would be okay for me to keep my cat? So what I learned in this situation was that she really didn't want to give up her cat at all. She wanted to do the right thing. She just wasn't sure what that was. So in the end, she kept her cat and I promised my help and support. And this is what I try to do every day of my life. Work to solve cat behavior problems so people don't have to sacrifice the cats who they love. Now, I do a lot of cat behavior counsels. I do between 900 and 1,000 cases every year. And I do them all completely free of charge. It's my personal mission in life that I never wanted to be a financial barrier preventing people from keeping their cats in their homes if the issue is a behavioral one. So when you talk to that many people about that many cats, you start to notice a few patterns. So I'd like to take this opportunity to highlight a few interesting things that people seem to think. So first, cats do not act out of revenge or spite with their pee or poop. Oh, I hear tales of woe. She peed on my bed to teach me a lesson. She peed on my laundry because she was mad at me. She peed on my luggage because she was afraid she was upset that I went on vacation. 
He peed on my shoes because he doesn't like my new boyfriend. Well, actually, maybe that one could be true. Cats are very good judges of character. But in all seriousness, I want everyone to know that cats do not pee inappropriately out of spite or revenge. Now, I understand that it's really easy to assign human qualities to cats because they really do share so many of our emotions. But spite and revenge are qualities we humans can proudly call our very own. Cats want to use their litter boxes. Cats are fastidious and clean creatures. So if your cat is not using the box, it's because something or someone in her mind is preventing her from using that box. But cats don't send us secret messages or things they wanna tell us with their pee or their poop. So second, you know that big basket of toys you have sitting in your living room and every once in a while I get tossed a few toys onto the floor or that big pile of fuzzy mice you have on the side of the room and you know you throw those out for your cat to play with. When I counsel people to play with their cats, Throwing a bunch of solo toys on the floor is not what I mean by play. So the big drawback of solo toys is your cat has to be both the predator and the prey. And this is not very realistic to your cat. So I can't tell you how many times people say to me, oh, my cat doesn't play. My cat's lazy, she doesn't like to play. But the problem is we humans don't take the time to play with our cat in a way that properly triggers your cat's prey drive. All cats have a prey drive. It's just a matter of figuring out the right way to trigger it. And a bunch of solo toys on the floor typically does not do the trick. The best way to trigger your cat's prey drive is to use a fishing pole type toy. When you use a fishing pole type toy, you can move the toy like prey. You can sometimes be flying up, sometimes you're down, sometimes you're high, sometimes you're low, you're hiding behind furniture and so forth. It's much more realistic for your cat. But here's the most important part. When you're playing with your cat, the most important part of the game is the capture. It's the captures that make the cat feel good. It's the captures that boost confidence in your cat. It's the captures that create all of those positive associations that feel really, really great to a cat. So many people think that the point of the game is how long you can keep the toy away from the cat. I watch people play and as soon as the cat gets close to it, whoops, they yank it away. But the truth is you want to let your cat get multiple captures during the game. Your cat's going to feel empowered and happy with that physical, tangible success that comes from watching, stalking, pouncing, and ultimately capturing. The capturing is that rewarding and satisfying part for your cat. So whip out that fishing pole type toy and stay with the game for a while. Intersperse the chasing and the pouncing with plenty of captures. Now, to make it a perfect play experience, I want you to finish the game with one last juicy final capture. So remember, you're simulating a hunt. So the prey got injured, the prey got tired, the prey dies, and now your cat gets one last final capture. And follow that immediately by a little treat or a portion of your cat's meal. This simulates the feast your cat would normally get after the capture if your cat was really you know, um, hunting for prey for his food. So the food after the capture is really important to your cat. It makes the game realistic. This is going to make him want to play again and participate in this game. But you know, food, kind of like in humans, it releases all kinds of feel good chemicals in the brain. And now your cat's gonna really feel like king of his castle or queen of her territory, your cat's gonna feel successful and your cat's going to feel satisfied. And guess what? When you use a fishing pole type toy, you are part of the game. 
So not only is this great fun for your cat, really satisfying, but it is an incredible cat-human bonding tool. You will see a difference in your relationship if you use a fishing pole type toy with your cat. So on that topic, now let's talk about laser pointers. I really wish pet supply stores did not sell laser pointers as cat toys. Now, laser pointers were developed to be used for PowerPoint presentations in the office, and that is where they should stay. Laser pointers are actually the cause of so many behavior problems in cats. Your poor cat is on this futile chase, pointlessly trying to capture this little red dot that can never be captured. Think of your poor cat, certain of a short cat she pounces only to find there's nothing there between her paws or between her teeth. It's an unwinnable game for your cat. Laser pointers create frustration and anxiety in cats. The exact opposite of what we wanna do when we play with our cats. We want, we want play to boost confidence and make them feel good and make them happy. Laser pointers do the opposite. But the worst part about laser pointers is they can cause a lot of problems between companion cats. The laser pointers leaving your cat unsatisfied. And the cat's gonna to wanna to get that capture someplace. And many times one cat will take this out on a companion cat and try to pounce and capture the other cat in the household. And you know, this may not be that acceptable to the other cat. So remember that cats expect a catch and kill after play. So if you're teasing your cat with a laser pointer, chances are that cat is going to try to attack, bite or scratch a companion cat or even the humans in the household. Many times I'll get questions about cats um, biting people's ankles or scratching people. And I will find out that the culprit is a laser pointer or those iPad toys um, and so forth. You want your cat to be able to get that capture. So remember that, it, that with all this frustration and pent up anxiety, you know, your cat is probably going to redirect that stress and anxiety somewhere. And usually these um, other methods of releasing anxiety are aggressive or destructive. So the moral of the story is, Play smart, play safe, and play in a way that satisfies your cat's natural hunting muscles by using a fishing pole type toy. You'll, your cat will be happier. And the best part of it is you and your cat are just gonna be having fun. So last, cats do not want or need privacy when they use their litter boxes. Now I know as humans, we want privacy. We don't want to go to the bathroom and have everybody seeing us. We want privacy. So we think, oh, our cat would like a covered litter box. But the problem here is we're looking at litter boxes from a human perspective and not a cat perspective. Your cat actually wants the complete opposite of privacy. So when your cat is in her litter box, she's in a very vulnerable position. The peeing position and the pooping positions are very vulnerable positions to a cat. It's easy for a cat to be ambushed or attacked when she's in the peeing or pooping position. So what is most important to your cat is that she has a clear, clean, visual field all around that litter box. She wants a 360 degree view all around that box. So. A covered box completely reduces your cat's field of vision. Also, another thing that's important to a cat is um, escape potential. Now, again, I know when we go to the bathroom, we're not thinking, hmm, how can I escape? But to a cat, again, it's very important because they're in a vulnerable position. And the worst thing about a covered litter box from a cat's um, escape potential is should an opponent or an invader appear, the only means of escape is directly into that opponent or invader's face. So that's not very reassuring to your cat. 
So there are many times people come to me and their cats aren't using the litter box. The first question I ask is, is your box covered or uncovered? Because covered boxes are a human convenience and a human need that we place upon our cats that often can cause litter box problems. Now, I know I've talked about opponents or invaders or even other cats in the household. And you might be thinking, well, I have an only cat. Even single cats in the household who have never been outside are always thinking about opponents and invaders. So I should mention these opponents or other cats can be real or imagined. Even only cats have this feeling. So we really want to toss those covers and make sure the cat has a complete view. Boxes that are under tables, wedged behind toilets, stuck under a sink. Um, these are all locations that your cat may not like. We might like bathrooms and annexes and, and places like that because we don't have to look at the litter box. But your cat wants the litter box in a place that has clear view all around it. So consider your cat's perspective when you're buying that litter box. I know to us, you know, it's just a plastic box with some litter in it, but to your cat, there's a lot of elements that go into using that box. So how did I get here? How did I get to this point in my life that I spend so much time talking about pee and poop and scratching? It's kind of been an interesting journey. So I guess like a lot of things in our lives, I'm gonna blame it on my parents. So my parents, my parents' views on pets, cats or otherwise, could not have been more different. My dad grew up in Dorchester, Massachusetts, and he grew up in a very small, crowded apartment that his immediate family shared with his extended family. Now, the apartment didn't allow pets, but it didn't really matter because they didn't have any room. And my father's family was extremely poor. They could barely feed themselves, let alone worrying about feeding and caring for a pet. On the other hand, my mother grew up in a single family home with lots of room and pets were cherished family members and loving companions in the household. So later in their marriage, my parents were forced to strike a bit of a compromise about pets in our home when their firstborn, me, seemed to have discovered an endless parade of cats in the neighborhood who really needed me and who somehow ended up at our house. But with bringing home all of these cats came lessons on responsibility. And I can remember this, I mean, it could have been yesterday, it's this clear in my mind. I must have been seven or eight years old. I'm sitting at the breakfast table, eating breakfast. I can even remember the, the dry cereal I was having with the milk on it. My dad came down the stairs and he saw me eating breakfast. And he said, Rachel, have you fed your cats yet? And I said, oh, dad, I'm gonna feed them as soon as I finish eating breakfast. And he looked at me and he said, no, stop eating. You need to feed those cats before you feed yourself. They're dependent on you. And so you always need to make sure that they are taken care of before you take care of yourself. And um, that was a very strong lesson that stayed with me till this very day. The first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I feed my cats before I do anything to take care of myself. And I deeply loved all of these cats and I mourned their loss when one died. And at some point, I began to memorize the names and the faces of all of the cats who had lived, loved, and then died at our house. One day I asked my dad again, I should mention he was a rabbi, um, whether all of those cats would, would meet me in heaven and whether they would recognize me and I them. He assured me that they would, that the cats would remember me and that I would remember them forever. Thinking back, the lesson I learned wasn't so much about the cats, but it was about my father's assurances that relationships with our cats last, that our relationships with our companion cats have meaning, 
that our relations with our cats are enduring. They're important. And to me, I grew up believing that that meant that they were worth saving. So my name is Rachel Geller. I'm a certified cat behaviorist, and I'm gonna take all of your cat behavior questions now. Thank you for having me tonight. So everyone feel free to unmute and ask away. For those of you who came in a little bit late, we are taping or recording this session and it will be available um, on the library's Facebook page and our YouTube channel. I'd like to say starting tomorrow, but I'm gonna be the only reference librarian there most of the day. So probably after Rosh Hashanah. Um, <clears throat> so we will see how that goes. Um, does anybody want to start? If not, I definitely have a question. <laughs> Anna, do you want to do you want to do you want to go first? Oh, okay. So uh, I have a male cat, four years old, pretty big cat that was my daughter's, and he's going to be mine for a few years. I've had him a couple of months, and he likes to be. You know, he'll get up on the kitchen table if I'm near there, and he wants me to pat him, and he. You know, he wants me to scratch his chin and then all of a sudden he'll take and bite my hand really, really tightly. And I'm sure it's part of play, but I can't get him off and it hurts and it really frustrates me. What do you think? Okay, so yes. So if the only stimulation in your cat's life is your hands moving around, he probably will go for that as some playtime and some capturing a prey. So the first thing I want you to do is get on a really good schedule of interactive play with a fishing pole type toy, the way I described. You're gonna get out that fishing pole, you're gonna really um, mimic the hunt, mimic prey, you know, don't dangle the toy wildly in the cat's face. Think of, of the prey kind of flying around and, and sometimes he's hiding, sometimes he's slithering. Multiple captures, final capture, food. A lot of people skip the final capture and the food part at the end. But what happens then is you're leaving your cat revved up instead of leaving him calm down. So not only is your cat feeling good and satisfied when you end with the final capture followed by food, but you then place your cat into his natural hunt, eat, sleep. And so that's going to help too. But I don't want you to get bitten in the meantime. So we're going to get going on that play therapy, but here's what we're going to do. We're gonna, I'm gonna teach you a little method called distraction and redirection. And this works best when you know the triggers of when your cat is going to bite. So you're ahead of the game because you sort of already know that when he jumps up on the table, that's a situation where he's gonna bite you. Um, so when you have a feeling, you sense or you just know that your cat is going to bite, I want you to distract your cat with a toy. You can use a crinkly mylar ball, some of those things that shake and there's like rice or something in them and they make noise. Something that makes noise is perfect. And I want you to throw the toy away from where he was about to bite you. So what happens, and most cats would way rather go after the prey. Your cat would rather do this than take out his frustration and anxiety by biting you. So. What I want you to do is distract your cat with the toy, move him away from where he was about to bite you. And what you're doing here is you're shifting your cat out of that anxious mode, tense mode, aggressive mode. You're shifting him out of that negative mode into the positive mode of a hunter. Being a hunter feels good to a cat. So now we're in a positive mode. Now what I want you to do is conduct a little impromptu interactive play session the way I described. Okay, he gets to release his tension. He gets captures. You don't get bitten. Everybody wins. So the good thing about this method is it's a positive way of retraining your cat. You need to give your cat a reason to like his new behavior. So yelling or you know making noise or spray bottles, I really don't like those. Those may help in the moment, but you're not gonna retrain your cat to have better behavior in the future. So this method stops that um, bad behavior because when he doesn't bite you, he's getting playtime, he's getting attention, he's getting treats, he's getting captures. So getting a capture and food after stimulation 
is way better. It's much more preferable than getting your skin after stimulation. So once you get into that pattern, you will, you will definitely notice your cat will break that habit and would prefer to do it the other way, just like you would. Now, if you feel like he, do you feel like he has a little petting aggression? Does he, does he bite you when you're petting him? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes. So mm. I was wondering, because you did notice, mention that. So another thing you can do in addition to what I'm already um, walking you through, and I put my website up here. So I'm giving like the bullet point answers, but if you feel like you need a more in-depth, just submit us. I have a submission form on my website. Remind me of your question and um, I can go over this in more depth for you if you need it. But some cats also have something called petting aggression. And this one does seem to take the cat owner by surprise because it happens when you think you're something pleasurable is going on and your cat's enjoying and then woof, all of a sudden you got bitten. So one thing that helps is to um, get more accustomed to the cat warning signs before you get to the point of biting because some cats do get overstimulated. So <laughs> is he twitching his tail? Is he glancing at your hand? Does his skin start to look a little twitchy? But so see if you can find those signals. But even if you can't, you can, we can solve this problem by using um, time. So typically if you pay attention, you'll find sort of a, a pattern of how long your cat will tolerate petting before, um, before he turns around and bites you. So let's say he allows two minutes of petting before a bite. So what I want you to do is consistently stop after 45 seconds. Let's say he only tolerates one minute of petting before a bite. You're gonna stop after 20 seconds. So what happens now is you're staying below his threshold and you're always stopping while your cat is still in a content state, maybe even wanting more rather than getting to the point of overstimulation. So pay attention to how long he'll let you pet him before he bites and stay below that point. Um, you can even do it by the stroke. If he allows five strokes, stop after two. So get a handle on how long he can handle it before the biting occurs and, and consistently stay below that. And that will really go a long way to preventing that behavior in the future, along with the other kind of techniques that I laid out. Thank you. You're welcome. So before we take another question, um, I just want to say we have a handful of people who've just joined. <clears throat> um, we're recording this and we will have the recording of this available on our the library's Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And if you're not on either of those things, you can email me directly or the library directly. And once I've got the recording all set, I will send it to you. And back back to the Q&A. <laughs> okay. I'm ready. Lori? Yeah. I have a few questions. Should I fire them all off and tell you? Or one thing at a time? Um, well, give me the first one first. <laughs> my, my cats quickly get bored with the with the fly toy. They uh, they'll go after it a few times and then they're like, ah, whatever. <laughs> so do you follow it with the final capture in food? Be honest. Oh, I'm, I missed what the final capture means. Oh, okay. So whenever you play with a fishing, um, with your cats, I always recommend using a fishing pole type toy. But what's right. very important during the game is you always wanna end the game with a final capture they get to capture the prey and then immediately follow that with food because the cat needs a point or a purpose for the play. So play is supposed to simulate a hunt. So we kind of wiggle a toy away and then we say, oh, would you look at the time and walk away? We're not satisfying our cat's prey drive and we're not satisfying our cat's natural desires. So what you wanna do is use a fishing pole type toy move it around in a way that um, simulates the prey. Okay, so sometimes like say it's a bird, sometimes it's flying up, sometimes it's flying around, 
It, maybe it's another type of animal. It's, it's, it's hiding around the furniture. It's slithering, slithering around a chair, whatever. Be really realistic in mimicking that prey. And during the game, let your cat have multiple captures. Let the cat get the toy. Um, when, he, when it stops moving, the cat will release his grip and you can start up the game again. But after about 10 or 15 minutes, you want to end the game with a final juicy capture. He's killed his prey. And then you need to follow that with food because cats expect a catch and kill after a hunt. This is natural to a cat. So most people who say to me, my cat doesn't play, typically they're not really playing with their cat in the way that triggers the prey drive and in a way that realistically simulates a hunt. So start using the fishing pole type toy, multiple captures during the game, final capture food, and you will see that your cat will enjoy the game much more because it's gonna be realistic. Otherwise it's sort of like, eh, why is she waving this thing around? Okay. Okay, what was your next question? Um, so one of my cats, um, when it's- Has been shown to reduce the risk of the COVID virus. Do you hear that? Okay, I'm gonna um, mute everybody else for the moment, just so that we, cause we've got some background going on right now. Keep, keep going. <laughs> uh, so anyway, when it comes to somewhere around mealtime, um, my cat tries to manipulate me by <laughs> going, going after things on the floor, going to try and eat things on the floor. She's like a little vacuum cleaner. <laughs> do, you, and, uh, um, do you leave out dry food during the day or do you? I, never, I don't feed them dry food at all. They're on oh, a okay. They're on a natural diet. Okay. So, um, and how often do you feed your cat? Twice a day. So if you're not leaving out food for the cat to nibble, you might want to um, break up the meals into smaller portions during the day or break up the meals, break up the portion and put it in several small bowls around the house. So your cat has to go on a fun expedition to find his food. So cats' bellies are smaller than ours are and, it, and cats, typically like to eat a little more often. So I would suggest, you know, breaking that up during the day if you don't want to leave food out. The other thing is she's, she's always obsessed with her, her best friend's dish. His, his dish always looks 100% more appetizing than hers, even though it's exactly the same. <laughs> so um, cats are territorial creatures and sometimes at um, food stations, is seen as a resource by cats. So um, oftentimes cats wanna protect their resources. So in her mind, this is put completely normal cat behavior. It may not be acceptable to you or to the other cat, but it's completely normal cat behavior. There are resources. She doesn't realize you can just go to the cabinet and bring out some more food. So she's just trying to protect resources. Um, what you can do is feed them in different rooms. If yeah. one cat, yeah. So there's little ways you can sort of um, manipulate that. There's even feeders that if your cat's a microchip will work on the microchip and only the right cat can get to the right bowl that way. So there's all <laughs> kinds of little tricks you can use, but just to reassure you, there's That's nothing <laughs> bad about that or nothing like she's not being um, jealous or manipulative. She's just normal cat behavior. Um, cats always want to protect their resources. And just like people, some cats have a stronger drive about certain things than others. Um, and that's okay. Uh, thanks. I've got a couple well, more, if, if that's okay. Well, let's, maybe we can let some other people ask and if there's room at the end or okay. my website is on there. If I don't get back to you, um, okay. shoot me and I will answer all of your questions completely free of charge. But we Thanks. might have room. We might have time. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to take advantage of the fact that nobody has their hand raised and ask my question. I have three cats, um, one of whom is an adorable, if somewhat loud and cranky, dilute torty who is 19 years old and has to get subcutaneous fluids three times uh, every other day. 
at least three times a week. To say that she hates it is an understatement. Um, is there anything that I can do to make this an easier process for her? She, We've got it so that we do it in a place where she feels safe and she knows at the end she gets cheese, so she gets treats, but she just yowls the entire yeah. time and it's getting worse as it goes on. And we feel terrible, but we want to keep her healthy and alive. Right, right. <laughs> And, and, and you can't explain that to a cat. And I completely understand. I've had um, many cats they've had to give fluids to. And, you know, some tolerate it better than others. So you, the treat after is terrific. Keep doing that. Um, one thing you could try is, is um, if you have her on your lap or you have her on your bed, I'm not sure where you do it, but wherever her nap, nesting place is when this is happening, Try spraying a little bit of comfort zone spray or okay. feel away spray on mm -hmm. that. Okay, this is very calming for a cat and that might help. So she, she'll be tricked into thinking she's already made this her own feel good, happy deposit area. And that might help a little too. And make okay. sure too the fluid isn't, isn't, isn't cold. Sometimes, you know, we leave, we leave it around and the room is cold or it's near a window. Make sure it's, you know, room temperature because the coolness can. We did figure too. that part out and we, we made sure it had been near a window. And we moved it to the inside part of the room. So it's on, you know, a pile of blankets on a yes. sofa so that it's, yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're doing everything right. You know, okay. um, add, add in the, add in the comfort zone or the feel away spray that will help and keep going with the reward after so she associates it with something positive oh, yeah. um, she, when she's done she runs off that <laughs> needle and she immediately turns around and goes Meow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know it's hard i mean think about you know i don't particularly like to be jabbed by needles either so no you know the thing is the difference <laughs> i can understand why <laughs> i might have to do that so you're doing everything right and um you know, she gets really, really ornery during when the fluids, you can always stop a little bit and make it up the next time. You can do that to a certain extent. So if she's, you know, really having a bad time, just that, keep- That is pretty much what we do. Um, yeah. You know, we're supposed to get 150 into her at a shot and sometimes it's 137 and sometimes yeah. it's 100 and sometimes you know, 163 and ask your vet too the i didn't realize it's the first time i went through this with one of my cats there are actually different size needles and you can get in much more quicker and faster with a little bit of a larger needle okay. so you might want to ask about that um because i couldn't believe the difference it halved the time of the procedure by having a needle that was a tad bigger. Okay. So you may want to ask about that too. I will do that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Who's next? Valerie. Hold on, hold on. We've got to unmute you. <laughs> okay. You may have to unmute yourself. I don't think I can. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, hi. I have a, a nine-year-old Berman who you keep seeing his tail going back and forth and he's very clingy. Um, I find it hard to get anything done because he always wants to be right where I'm working. He's and also gorgeous. Thank you. <laughs> he's a very pretty boy. Um, and he's, you know, he's, uh, he's always with me and he wants to be right there and he likes to be petted all the time. And it's hard for me to work on the computer and all when I, when I have to give him constant attention. And if I don't, he's really very good with his paws. He'll take his paws and pull my hand to his face to try to get me to stroke him. Um, and when he gets my hand, he'll start licking it, licking it, licking it. I mean, really almost compulsively. And he'll be nibbling and licking and nibbling and licking. And it I, you know, I, I've tried denying it. I've tried, you know, they said to flick his ear to get it to stop the nibbling, licking thing, but he just, he's just so affectionate that he just really wants a lot of attention. It just wants my attention all the time. Is there anything I can do to, you know, kind of minimize that a little? I don't mind. I like it, but it's, it's a lot. 
I, I understand that you can't, even I understand that you can't pet your cat 24 seven. So I get it. <laughs> um, so a few things that you can do. So the, the licking and the over grooming, usually that's a sign of anxiety and tension and not that your cat is stressed out, but you know, we all get that feeling when we need to release something, right? So, I mean, I like to go for a run. Some people like to do crossword puzzles, whatever it is, we all have that thing. Um, I would suggest to start off with a, an activity called a puzzle, a puzzle feeder. Are you familiar with those? I have those, yeah. Okay. He so, those, but he's really good with his paws. So he just, he goes right through that like nothing. He's very smart. Yeah, so try to find, so that's good that he likes them. So now we're on to something. So there's all kinds of, um, Doc and Phoebe is a company. It's D-O-C, the word and, the woman's name Phoebe. They make the best interactive activity toys and puzzle feeders. They're my go-to toy that I recommend to people. They have all, a lot of different, um, and I don't work for the company. This is just a really good interactive activity toy. They have a lot of great options. And um, look on the website. You can probably find some things that your cat would enjoy doing that will be a good challenge. Um, another brand is Kong, K-O-N-G. They have these wobbler um, games where the cat really has to interact and use his paws to get the toy at like the right angle to dole out a treat. Right. And so those are kind of fun too. But the Doc and Phoebe, I find, have a really good variety. Even, um, even something as simple as breaking up his food into little tiny portions and putting the bowl all, make him, make that how he has to get his meal. That's going to keep him busy. And he has to go like on a fun expedition, be linking around the house to, to eat. And that will keep him busy too. And those kinds of things also sort of release that pent up anxiety and stress. Um, the other thing you can do is the, there are those um, brushes and groomers that you can attach to your walls at like cat height or even those upside down new ones. And the cats can kind of like groom and get brushed on their own without you. you. To entice the cat to use it, you can spray a little bit of feel away or comfort zone onto those um, items. And or you can even sprinkle a little fresh catnip over there to entice your cat. But that's another thing that the cat can use to feel good and get attention without always um, bothering you. And you can always distract and redirect, just like I explained before to Anna, you can distract and re redirect over to those items and then give your cat a little reward for using them so he kind of gets the idea. Because a lot of times once cats see that something feels good or something is fun, they're going to want to do it on their own anyway, because that's just going to be in, enticing and appealing to a cat. Rachel, if you don't have fresh catnip, would spray catnip also work? I suppose. I mean, a lot of cats like the fresh one because, you know, it's fresh and it mm -hmm. has it has a more of a of a good aroma. But right. yeah, you can try the spray one. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, this one is climbing my curtains right now because I'm not paying attention to him. I'm paying attention to you. So he really does want my attention all the time. So it's it's tough. It's a 24-7 job. Yeah, you have to really get in the habit of, of redirecting to something else, redirect the puzzle toy, redirect to um, an interactive toy. Do you have um, tall sisal wrapped posts in your house? Yeah, I have one in uh, every floor. At least three feet tall? Oh yeah, they're five feet. Okay, perfect. Yeah. You can redirect to those. That's another thing that you can run um, a fishing pole type toy on and get, get him to sink his claws into that and get him used to that as an alternative as well. Yeah. But, but you know, be consistent, <laughs> don't give in. Um, be, and, and he, you know, catch a smart, he will learn that these are equally appealing alternatives. Oh, good. Thank you. You're welcome. I think, does Randy have his hand up? Yes. Yep, you, you'll need to unmute yourself. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. 
Hello. <laughs> um, we have we have two cats, um, both of whom were um, procured um, right around the beginning of the pandemic. From a shelter. From a shelter, yeah. Um, one was four months old, tiger cat, and the other uh, black cat who was seven years old at the time. And at the uh, animal shelter, we, we introduced them for the first time and they seemed to get along well enough that we thought, okay, we're gonna do this. So we brought them home and the, the tiger, um, the baby, um, she, uh, she grew up very quickly and uh, her weight is now like 15 and a half pounds. She's a bruiser and she's a bully. Um, the black cat, um, is a, um, a, a she's a she's a a little one she's a runt. she's a runt she she weighed seven pounds got up to close to eight and then she then the last time we brought her to the vet she was down below her original seven so we thought because the bully is always getting to the bowls and just always eating that we had to do something to to get some food you know, to the, the smaller one. So we have taken to giving like a half a can of Fancy Feast to the, the, uh, the older cat in a, in a closed bedroom, um, much to the chagrin of, <laughs> of Fatso. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we're just wondering, we, we keep um, dry food. What is it we serve, we give them? Yeah, we have Purina Pure, one. Purina one. Um, and we keep two bowls out and a water bowl all the time uh, because I want the, the, the little one to always be able to get food. And she does eat some of the dry food, but she kind of picks at it. So um, she is now getting a little more food. I mean, we want, we want her to gain a pound yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. sort of, um, and be healthy. Um, but the little, but the, the, the baby, <laughs> the baby bully um, <laughs> just <laughs> keeps at the bowls. So is there is there a way to sort of deal with that? Yeah, so that's, you know, a very common problem in cat household and multi-cat household. Currently, right now, I have an 18-pound Maine Coon <laughs> cat, and I, I have a six-pound, so I can completely relate to your situation. Yeah. So there are a few things we can do. Um, First, the, uh, your idea of separating so that you can make sure the little one eats is perfect. Keep doing that because then at least you know for sure that cat's getting a certain amount of food. But for the, for the food obsessed fat cell, here's some techniques for that. Um, okay. One thing I love for food obsessed cats is a product called Bonito Flakes. It's B-O-N-I-T-O. -O. It's just dried fish. It's extremely low in calories, like two calories in a serving. But if you add a little bit of water to it, it feels to the cat like real food. It has a real fishy smell. So it's a way to trick the food obsessed cat into getting the food that she wants. So you can give this Benito Flakes to the fat one all you want. She's not going to gain any weight by eating Benito Flakes. So it's a terrific alternative to give her this, you know, to kind of trick her into thinking that she's eating. The other little trick you can do is plain pumpkin puree. They do make a cat pumpkin puree. A brand that I really like is um, PetSmart Authority and it's not an expensive brand. Solistics also makes a nice one and Weruva makes a nice one. But here's what you can do. Mix a little of the plain pumpkin puree into the cat's wet food. It's very high in fiber. The fiber will expand in the cat's stomach and will make her feel very full. And that will also help the, the fat one from not wanting to eat as much. So try okay. those two things, the plain pumpkin puree and the bonito flakes. Okay, again, we're feeding her dry food. Um, so will all of this mix in with the dry food? And what happens to the little girl who, you know, 
who also will pick it back food. So the bonito flakes is is a dry food. It's a oh, dried okay. fish that you're just going to add a little bit of water to. The if the if the little one wants to pick at it, fine. But this is something you can give to the fat one to her heart's content because there's no calories in it. So it's just a way to trick her into giving her what she wants mm -hmm. because you're not going to change that in her, right? She wants right. to eat. We're not changing that. So we need to work around it. So we're going to trick her into thinking she's getting the food that she wants. The, okay. um, the um, pumpkin puree, you can absolutely just coat that, coat the dry food a little bit with that. That will work fine. Just mix okay. it in. You don't need a lot. The fiber is going to fill right, her belly right up. But start off with the bonito flakes. That might be a little easier for you. Okay. Yeah. And where, where do you get that? You can get them at any pet supply store like Petco or PetSmart, um, Chewy, Amazon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, I would and try that first. It's probably your path of least resistance. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. Are, are there are there instructions on these uh, products? Um. <laughs> You can you can email me. You can reach out through my website if you need more explicit instructions. But for the Benito flakes, it's basically add a little water, and for the pumpkin puree, it's add a little bit into the food. So neither one of them is toxic or anything like that. So okay. you should be okay. okay. Are you, you get them both at the supermarket though? Also, well, you got to make sure the Benito flakes you can probably get at the market, but the pumpkin puree you got to really make sure it's made for cats. You don't want the people one. You don't want any spices or other flavors in there. Right. And, yeah. uh, have you have you given everybody your email address yet or is that coming later? Or? It's in the chat. It's in the chat. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you. My website is on the chat. You can read there's a submission form on there. All my information's on there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So we've got about five minutes left before uh, Rachel has another appointment. Anybody else have any other questions? And just as a reminder to those who still came in later, uh, apologies for us having messed up the time on the Zoom. And this is being recorded and will be posted on the library's Facebook page and YouTube channel. And if you don't do either of those things, email us and we will happily send it to you once it is available. So Lori, I think you had one other question, right? I can probably squeeze you in. We'll find that one. Yeah. Shall we look back on this? Sure. <laughs> Lori, you're muted. And I have a question. Uh, my cat has very strange habits around the litter box. Um, she likes to pee in an empty box, which is fine, but she likes to poop on the floor. Oh, mine does that. Um, how many how many litter boxes do you have? I have several. And okay. I have I have one especially for her without anything in it because she likes to pee that way. And she used to pee sometimes pees down right down the the uh, drain of the bathtub. She loves to do that. So the cats are very tactile animals, and there are a lot of cats who don't like the feel of litter. So that's not uncommon. Um, but litter box problems are very complex. Usually I start off by telling people to do what I call a real estate reality check and really make sure that your litter boxes are in a place that is wide open because the cat doesn't want to poop in a place where he can't see all the way around him. So if your box is against a wall, I tell people to pull it out 12 inches. If it's in a corner somewhere, bring it out of the corner. If it's in a room, like a basement, or an attic where there's stairs involved. Some, for some cats, the stairs can be a harrowing journey, very harrowing journey to get to the litter box if they're afraid of opponents or invaders. Um, it's not the case at all with, uh, I, mine are in an open space and. And um, are they low sided or high sided boxes? I have one high side and the rest are low side. Um, and is the poop that's always outside of the box? Uh, no, she likes to poop in different places. Often she'll 
poop in the bathroom in the four corners, um, but sometimes she'll poop in different other places in the house. Where where are your litter boxes located? Well, I have I have a couple downstairs and I have a yeah. couple upstairs. Um, and upstairs is that like on the main floor of the house or? Uh, well, I have a big bathroom and there's litter boxes in the in the big bathroom. In the middle of the floor. Yeah. Okay, so look, so one thing you might want to do is if the box is kind of on the same side, even though it's in the middle of the floor, if it's on the same side as the entrance, sometimes the cat needs to be able to see like out the entrance and into the hallway. So try to maybe think about positioning that box so they can see out the doorway and into the hallway. It is um, that yeah. way. Okay, yeah. so I think since your question is probably more complex than I can answer like in a little Zoom, I would okay. say reach out to me on my website and what I'll probably do is set up a Zoom with you personally so I can see your setup you know, more clearly on my own because sometimes when I look at it with my own eyes, I'll think of something that I may not be able to just tell from you know, you describing it quickly to me and I can go more through, you know, your own cat and what your, some things that your particular cat might be afraid of. Like, for example, I've worked with people who's have their litter boxes in the basement and the cat was in the box when like the laundry started or the spin cycle or the water in the pipes. And then the cat became afraid of the litter box. So sometimes we have to go through a whole sort of, um, Sherlock Holmes session to kind of figure things out. So um, definitely reach out to me and I'm happy to help. Thank okay, you. And I think Patricia had a question and I think that may be our last one. Patricia, what's your question? Yeah, um, whenever a cat gets loose outside in Greenfield and runs away uh, and the owner posts it on social media, a lot of people suggest put the, put the cat's litter box out on your front porch and that's how the cat will find its way home. And I always wonder, is there any truth to that? That's a great question. No, you never want to put the litter box out because that will attract, attract predators. The best thing to do is put out things with your scent. So like a shirt that you've worn all day long, put that outside. Um, if you can safely open your windows, open your windows a little bit so that your cat can catch the scent. And... Um, a humane trap is often your cat, the cat does not go too far away. So a humane trap on your property is, is a, a really good way to, you know, entice the cat back as well. But no, this, don't use a litter box. That's going to attract predators. Um, cats go to great lengths to not have their poop or pee, you know, right near them where they're hanging out so that they're going to instinctively stay away from that. So Things with your scent, things with the cat scent, open the windows, humane trap, and of course the usual suspects, notify your ACO, area shelters, um, lots of posters and so forth. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and Rachel, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Um, if it's okay with you, when I post the video on our social media, I will also include your website on that as well so the people can see it. Yes. And uh, everybody, Petra Kitties, have a good night. Good night, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Bye, Rachel. Thank you. It was great. Thanks Thank for you. having me. Good night. Good night. Bye bye. Bye. And